Hi, everyone. Good morning. Today we will talk about an important topic in sequential data processing, about the change point detection. It's about how you can detect some change or distribution or the model if you observe a sequence and you expect that at some point the distribution of data in the sequence will be different. So let's talk in more details about change point detection, when and where you can apply it, and what kind of mathematics is behind it, and can we construct theoretically optimal approaches, methods, algorithms to change point detection. Now, this lecture is a bit more heavier than typical lecture in this course in terms of how many formulas do we have and so on. So please mind what you are looking at, mind what you are listening, and don't hesitate to ask questions in progress if you have any. So let's start with what is a change point and how it is connected to real world problems. So you can say that typically uh, we observe a lot of time series, multivariate time series, traffic, stock prices for different firms, atmosphere pressure, uh, data on electro, okay, measurements taken from human at some point, and so on. And what we have here is typically multivariate time series, or even a series of like of images or measurements from complex devices. Okay. But if you look closer at this time series, we can say that sometimes something strange happens and we can observe it when we look closer at some, for example, one dimensional time series. Uh, for example, we can say that something breaks and we have change in mean value of our sequential data from here at this point. Also, we can say that, okay, we have the dynamics like this, then dynamics like this, dynamics like this, and so we have two change points in this time series. Also, we can observe no change in mean or in a slope of our time series, but rather we say that at some point, uh, variance increases and so on. Now we see that the dynamic of the process is again different. Maybe we can say that there's two change points here. One at this point when we have this decrease of the variance almost to zero compared to other parts of the time series. And then we see that again, we have some outliers and the variance of time series increases being non-zero. Also, we can sometimes observe much more complex patterns like this and this and overall what's going on with this strange time series and uh, we want to catch them all we want to design a procedure that can be able to detect the changes as fast as possible uh, okay we start with basic problem of identifying the change but for sure we want to do this faster and this low number of false alarms and we will come back to more formal definition of what we want a bit later okay another example is like pressure in some complex hydrodynamic systems uh, when we see when based on Boltzmann method and here we say that we have no change in mean value no change in variance section i suppose they're like typical range of values here and here uh, are the same. Uh, so we can say that something is different and we want to catch it with our model again. So this is a change point we want to catch to. Maybe we can say, okay, it's some kind of periodicity in time series that was before this uh, red uh, vertical line and there is no structure like this after it. Uh, another example from the real world stock prices. 
uh, in particular because it may be the most famous s and p index of 500 most valuable most important companies in united states and here we also can try to attack some changes okay the best scenario when we try to predict it beforehand and say okay after a while we will observe a change point so we should pay attention to this and take some actions but uh, if the change occurs we want also do some kind of now casting and say okay we have change point here and this is this is crucial and we want to, to detect this change point fast and take actions at least after some point after some time after the change and so we can here observe this change we discussed two slides earlier when we have change of the slope and change of the overall dynamics we have this increase before and decrease after dot-com crisis or financial crisis in 2008 and this is not the only like not the only problem we want to check uh, the real problem i took part a bit in in yandex was to how can we detect that we observe change point when we look at time series like this, for example, we observe how many users, how many requests these users make to our system. And as okay, users typically sleep at night, uh, we say that our curve is cyclical. We have cycles here, some periodicity and so on, but we still want to detect some changes often related to some problems with the system. We can say, okay, if you have curve like this, and then sudden abrupt drop of number of requests, it's typically connected with downtime of service. And this is what we want to detect. We want to detect that at some point, something happens at our site and users no longer can assess our system, our service. In this time, the changes live not for long but it is crucial to take them to say to the operator to like to an engineer who maintains the system that now we observe some strange behavior and it's not that easy to detect it from the data we have yet you should take into account also periodicity and the overall model of our time series to make the model successful to make the model work successful Another example related to drilling. So someone is drilling an oil or a gas well, and you observe, for example, nuclear response here. And we can say that at some points we have changes here, here, and here. Okay, it seems that it's uh, like typical change, maybe the simplest model possible change in the mean. But it is not that clear when we remove the black line related to the weighted moving average here. Uh, but also what's important is that typically in our time series, we can observe more than one change. And in this case, we should develop a specific procedure that can say that we have one change, then we have another change, another change and so on uh, basically we can say that there's regime switches and we again want to detect them as fast as possible to take some actions in this case uh, they wanted to be able to modify the driven strategy to optimize this to reduce expenses related to this whole process of drilling and to reduce risk related to it so try to avoid some accidents during drilling of a well. Okay, and this is not the only five or six problems. We can say they require change point detection, fast change point detection. We can actually discuss a lot of other problems related to change point detection. 
we can say that okay then we have some network and some intruder at some moment can assess it after an attack then we have we observe the change of behavior and we again want to attack the change as fast as possible also again we can try to look at the video stream and the sequence of images and try to detect some problems here when you observe for example road and suddenly it's a traffic jam and we want to again detect it very fast this is okay you can look at all these problems here maybe i highlight this one because it's kind of important right now we want to be able to detect outbreaks as fast as possible to again take some actions it's not evident how can we do this and also maybe when we look at like this modern scenario of this corona and your stems appear uh, and want to detect again that something here is happening something that we should worry about and to do this we should be able to do this kind of change point detection Again, there are some other applications related to medicine, uh, to like observing video or observing like, some data from sensors and so on. Uh, but what is common in all of this problem is that we have some time series, maybe multivariate time series or a sequence of observations. At some point, change happens. And we want to detect it and to detect it as fast as possible and to have as low number of false alarms as possible. So that's basically our problem. And so let's formally define it after you look at these slides at what we have already seen and say in the chat with a plus sign that you understand what's going on. And also, please do an additional task and uh, propose a problem, a change point detection problem that can be solved using some kind of data. Driving technologies, please feel free. Okay, actually, please do it, everyone, in the chat. Uh, it's like for two minutes. So. Recording. Yes, Paulina. Can you please write it in the chat? Yeah, some example of. Mm, yes, okay, yeah, we can try to do this. Also, this is what we also can try to solve in other ways. Uh, maybe we can say something that we have, for example, periodicity with the length of the period to be one year and try to model it with more traditional methods. But sometimes, yeah, we have some abrupt change, for example, weather changes, and so change the demand on like something related to heat or related to something want to farm up something and in this case yeah we have this idea this intention to change the demand and update our strategy maybe related to delivery of particular products to our magazines to our shops yeah and other problems guys girls i have I see only one, but there are plenty of them, maybe related to your practice.
Yes, Nikita, also a good example. When something changes in the text and you can say, okay, there is something different, maybe the mood of a people will communicate to changes and you should adapt to it in your chat board and so on, yeah, it's possible. Also a nice idea, thank you, Nikita. Any other ideas on when you can apply change point in real life? Mm, yes, yes, also good example and also good example because uh, you, okay, kind of, it's not an easy to detect this uh, change with this maybe change of mean and so on. Okay, I think it's uh, three good examples. Thank you a lot, Shakir, Nikita, Nikita and Elisaveta. But let's try to more formally define what kind of problem we are solving right now. How we define the change point detection. Okay, so basically we have this univariate multivariate time series. Uh, we have some data we observe, Xn with n being time index and axis observations at this time index. And we have some change point. We have start of our observations of our surveillance and at some point change happened. So, so we have some regime before normal regime and normal uh, no, abnormal post change point regime. So, we can say that actually we observe something, a realization of a random process in some space, some probabilistic space mm -hmm. that defines this random process. Okay, and it has the following structure, C1, C2, and so on, CT for all Gs we consider. Okay, we observe not this random variables, it's the functions actually, uh, but rather we observe some actual measurements, x1, x1, and so on, up to x theta plus one. And so our goal is to detect a change point here. And we can say that we have some change before change point part and after change point part. And here we say, for example, in our simplest model now, dependence between the observations like my, quite easy to handle random process but we have some distribution before p infinity and some distribution after change p zero we will later discuss why we have these names right also we have some observations related to before and after change point parts and we have this moment we want to detect, change point here. Uh, for example, we can say that we have some change in me. So let's look at the simplest possible model for change point here. Okay, we have some by noise, so ID observations uh, from some distribution, maybe even like Gaussian with some mean, zero mean and some variance. So this is our basic thing. And if you don't have this first term, then we have no change actually. We observe like a sequence of observations from white noise, something like this. But we say that we have a change point. And in this case, we define the change point in the mean value of our process. After the moment theta, we have this indicator function. So we add mu to our process. So we have this mean before change point, then the time moment theta, change point happens, and we add this mu to our observations. And so this is our model we can, for example, look at the simplest one, but quite often useful if 
you know that you have this change in them. Okay, so we have two distributions in a more general case that define what's going on. Uh, the first distribution assumes that the change point occurs at the infinity time here, and all our observations from C1, C2, C theta minus one, and so on, follows, follows the distribution P infinity. We have another alternative. That the distribution uh, is the same all the time. Now uh, the change occur at the time moment zero. That is that equals to zero. In this case, we say that okay, we have this p zero distribution here, and uh, also when you have something in between, something interesting, we say that at the start we have p infinity distribution. Then at time moment theta, we have this p zero distribution for our axis. Okay, we can assume that our distributions have densities, correspond density like f infinity and f zero, and some expected values for these densities, e infinity and again e zero. And so we can say that if you know these distributions, know the densities, we can try to define a measure for our like change point at time of theta. In, in this way, we measure the joint density, uh, given that the density is f infinity uh, before change point and another change after it. And so in this case, we look at the product of these two sequences. And so we have the joint density for our distribution from x1 to xn, which defines like the distribution with the change and the moment theta. And so we can say that, for example, we can try to look at this density for all possible change points and look at the theta that gives you maximum density especially if you know these two densities f infinity and f zero. Some examples here. Uh, we have some line that produces products. We measure the length of each product, C1, C2, and so on. So you can say they're pretty much independent if no change occurs or if change occurs. And each one belongs to R plus, so it's a positive length. Okay, a good assumption, not about positivity, but a general assumption that our axis are IDD, random variables, independent, identically distributed, uh, with this M infinity mean value and some variance. Also, we can say that we have an alternative and an alternative is that we have another mean value because the process is defective is not what we expect this mean value mu zero and this corresponds to the time moment theta that equals to zero for our change if from the very beginning we observe different, different, different process okay and so we can say that we observe again something in between a change at time moment theta with the, the distribution before like this and distribution, distribution after like this. And so we can say that, okay, our change would be something that reflects, for example, the maximum likelihood scenario. Also, we can define the stop in time, like again, more formally, what, what, how we make our decision. Uh, so we have observations up to time n of our process. And we want to give an alarm to say this. We observe a change point here at time at some moment, for example, t equals to tau equals to n. 
and uh, our stopping time is actually a statistic. So it's based on the information we have up to time moment. And so it's like one, two, and here, and we make some decisions. And our assumption is that we can try to this as some actual function and we can try to recover it. We can try to have some statistics of the data, gamma. And we can base our stopping time on the statistic gamma. We say, okay, we have some gamma that depends on all previous observations. So gamma one depends on one x gamma two on two axis and gamma three on three axis and so on and on and on and on and so we want like consider the family of stopping times related to this statistics of observations that we somehow produce like the simplest example we can imagine is that if this gamma n is greater than some threshold gamma with a wave, then we say that we have tau that equals to n if it is the first time for gamma to exceed the threshold. Okay. So we can now define some how well we are detecting change time. What are the quality measures measures for our problem? Okay, we look at two processes. One with a change point at some time moment, new here, blue process. And so we want to attack change point for it. And we have our statistics, our statistic like gamma here and some threshold A in this slide. And you say, if the statistic exceeds the threshold, then we detect a change point. In this case, for blue curve, we detect it here. And so we define the first quality measure for our data, detection delay. The difference between the actual change point and the time we detect. So the difference between G capital and new. Okay, but if you want to minimize this quality measure only, we can say that, okay, each point, we, each time, each time moment, we signal about this change point. In this case, we have zero delay detection, but we are definitely doing something wrong. So we need another quality measure that measure how many false alarms do we have or something similar. So let's look at normal process, a red curve as a slide. And for this red curve, we see that uh, as we observe something random, at some time point, we also see that our statistic will exceed the threshold. And in this case, we can say that we look at the length, the run length to false alarm G capital. So we want detection delay to be small, but run length to false alarm big. So we have two conflicting, me conflicting measure, uh, like naive solution to minimize detection delay is to report about the change point at each time moment, and again, naive approach to minimize number of false alarm is to never give a signal about change point. Definitely, these two alternatives are not the best one, not we're looking for. And we are looking at something in between. When we have, have not very large uh, detection delay, but quite large time to false alarm here. So we can formally try to again define these things. Uh, we can say that we have some statistic here that depends on previous observations and stopping time. And we can say that we can under this distribution infinity. So it means that 
no change point until infinity. And so mean value in this assumption of the tau of the stopping time is our false detection delay. And we want it to be as close to infinity as possible. We don't want any false alarms here. Also, we want uh, another measure related to the detection delay. We can say that we observe change point at time zero, and we see how long it takes for us to detect it. At least we observe or try to calculate mean value for this random variable. As this is like this. Often we can say a scenario when we have change point at some moment theta. And in this case, we say that we observe the difference between tau, the detection time, and theta, the change point time. Uh, and given that tau is bigger than theta, and this would be our average detection delay. And for sure, we want it to be small be as close to zero as possible. If you take expectation with respect to this measure zero, which means that change point, change time, theta equals to zero. So this is basically what we want. We also say what we want in slightly different words. We will need it when we will discuss uh, more formally how we define this kind of behavior, how we define what's good and what's bad, and what procedures are optimal. We can say, for example, what is the probability of false alarm? We can calculate the probability that chow is smaller than theta if we have change point in time theta. So it's a probability of false alarm uh, given some distributions for theta and for normal and abnormal after change data. As you can expect, bad value for this variable is something close to zero. In this case, we have uh, false alarms at almost any case. Uh, we also can look at uh, detection delay here. And this is what we want to be close to zero. We again look at this average detection delay. So basically it's similar to what we have before, but here we look at false alarm from a different angle. And so, so be it. But as a general practice is the same. Detection delay and time to false alarms. Uh, is something a something different uh, because there is a like, so correspondence between them and actually there is some kind of part of frontier related to these two metrics. But the intuition behind them is quite simple. So now we have the formal definition of that there is some random process with some known or not known distributions before or after a change point. And we have some desire to look at both conflicting measures and select a best trade-off between them. So let's think, how can we detect a change point? And we'll start with some naive methods that don't rely on theory, but quite easy to understand. So basically, we look at data before time t, and this is our detector, a procedure of change point detection. And at the time, it reports either that we okay, there is no change point here, or we say there is, uh, we should have an alarm here at some moment. And we define, for example, this alarm time 
is the minimum time when our statistics exceed the threshold defined. In this case, threshold is hash here. Okay. And so the simplest procedure can be like this. It's called Schuhart control charts. We split observations to bins, batches. And so we have it like, like this. Observations and split to batches of size n. So each batch is our observations in the ratio of indexes from n times k, k, k minus one plus one to n times k. And we calculate log likelihood here for each batch separately because we have k batches in total. And we, if you know the distribution, we can look at the minimum time when the statistics exceed when this log likelihood exceeds a threshold. So if at some moment we have some increase, then we say there is something, something different happening here. So basic example, like from quite old work is like this. We calculate this likelihood for F0 uh, for the assumption that change point occurs at time zero. And at some point we observe that there is some change in typical values for our log likelihood, given that the change point already happened. This is the first option. Uh, if you want to estimate the difference in mean, we have the second option, also pretty simple and pretty natural. This is an exponential weighted mean average. We can say, let's define the recursive estimate for the mean. We have some initial value of mu zero, and then at each step, we define m hat k as the previous value multiplied by some y minus lambda plus lambda times current observations. Here lambda is how much we add to our knowledge if you look at this new data. And the weight is some parameter of our approach for sure, but also we can say that if you observe change in mean at some point, then a bit later we will see that our moving average will increase some threshold. So we can say that our stopping time for exponential weighted moving average is minimum k such that corresponding recursive estimate of mean exits as threshold. And we can see that the statistics looks like this in this case. And so we have a lot of tension. This was two basic new methods, Schuhart control charts and conventional weighted mean average. For sure, they are not universal. And also, it can be proved that, that they are not optimal. Because for Schuhart, we use some bins. And these bins should be of optimal size, of no size. And for exponential weighted moving average, we also put some very specific assumptions about the data and also can only detect change in means. Let's define more formally what we want and then provide some estimates of what we can do in this case. So we say we are looking for approaches for techniques that have false law probabilities more than alpha. So the probability that our stopping time is more than theta is no more than alpha. And so we are looking at all procedures, all tau's that are based on our observations up to time t. And so for in this family, we look for mm, this guy for 
that follows this formula that minimizes this expected time for the different expected time, expected detection delay, actually. The difference between uh, stopping time and actual true change point here. And so we want to define our approach like this. So basically, we say the probability of false alarm is smaller than some threshold. And in this scenario, we want to minimize the detection delay. We can also define some different optimality criteria. This one is called A for some reason, but we can also have some stopping criteria, C and G, and well, what are they? We again define some family of procedures. In this case, there are procedures that have the time uh, to before false alarm smaller than t. Uh, so uh, in this case, infinity is like change point doesn't happen, and expectation of the stopping time is, should be larger than g capital. And for C criterion, we say that we are looking for the guys in this family yeah, defined here, such that we want to maximize uh, with respect to theta this expectation of detection, detection delay. I think it's, it's better to say this with infinite here. We want the change detection delay to be, to be small. Also, we can define um, additional criteria D, which uh, basically is the same, uh, but uh, is defined in slightly different ways. So basically, we are looking at the change detection, G tau minus theta plus, which means that we are looking at positive changes. And we minimize this quantity for a sigma algebra induced by the perturbation structure of the current element. So we have this kind of criterion. And we also can try to define procedures and say uh, what criterion corresponds to what procedure. And let's define Kusum or cumulative sums statistic. In this case, we say that this our statistic has the following property. We have it as a maximum of zero and g n minus one plus log likelihood, a typical log likelihood for our data or the ratio of the likelihoods for our densities f theta and f infinity. And we say, okay, our statistic would be larger if f zero, it would be larger than f infinity. And we can just put it here and say that our statistics would behave like this, with this moment being the change point. And we define the stopping time as usual. We say that this statistic related to consume uh, would be larger than us, and we say, okay, we have some change point. And uh, it happens, if we can prove that consume is an optimal criterion, uh, is an optimal, then we consider this max loading criterion, as far as I can remember, is criteria C here, when we consider this balance between these two measures. Okay, you can look at this statistic uh, for okay, some example here for artificial data with signal to noise ratio mu divided by sigma that equals two. You can say, okay, we have some small spikes, but often we observe something like zero here. 
because again, we have not changed before. And after change, we increase, continue to increase this Gusum statistic until we say, okay, we have some change point because we exceed a threshold. Our first option, our first strategy. Not the only one. Okay, we can try to see that if we increase signal to noise ratio or decrease it, then we have like typical larger time to false alarm here and more, more like more spikes here. And so on. We can also look at other statistics. In this case, you can say, okay, we have this so-called Sherev and Robert statistics, uh, firstly published by Sherev, and then reinvented by Roberts. You can say, okay, quite common, quite good, and it was even mentioned in a series on, like, don't know, was it? Um, yes, numbers, series and episode 308 on time series noise. So uh, the statistics is like this. We have this R0, R1, R2, and so on for each time moment. We have this likelihood ratio that correspond to time moment N. And we calculate Rn in this way here. And we define the stopping time as the first time when our statistic, should I robust statistic, statistic exceeds the threshold. Uh, like threshold ash again. So the second step is the same for almost all we have, almost all statistics. The difference is how we define the statistics. And in this case, like this case, it was quite obvious that it should somehow work and it did, yeah, do have some natural explanation. In this case, it's not that evident, but also we can say that it's related to what we observed. It's instead of some, we consider product and it can be better. And we can see that in this case, it's kind of interesting that this time to false alarm time is much smaller here. And we have no non-zero values for statistics to the left of change point. And this is the case even for high signal to noise ratio. And we should decrease signal to noise ratio to 0 0.2 to observe that, okay, we also have something here before the change, some values, no zero values of the statistic. So it's kind of more powerful and it's also more optimal here in terms of theory. We also can try to define the statistics in a different way. Actually, we can consider the statistics like this with Pn is a probability that change point is smaller than n given our observations. And it has the form like this, where again, we look at the previous value of the statistics here, the phi, with some hyperparameters P and Q, and this likelihood ratio of the ratio of f0 and f infinity. Again, we define the stopping time in this way. And this criteria actually is optimal under this A scenario described before. And we can say yes, also it works quite good in my opinion. So basically what we talked about, we talked about quite important problem in sequential data processing. How we can detect change in our data? 
how we can say that the distribution is different. Uh, we defined a formal framework on what is good and what is bad related to detection delay and to the mean time to false alarm. And we define some kind of optimal criteria in this case. And we can say that at some time moments when we apply one statistic or the statistic, it's optimal according to different criteria we introduced. Uh, basically, we introduced very basic ideas on how can we take change point based on exponential weighted moving average and Schuhart control charts. But we can say that we can do even better if we produce some optimal criterion like Shreya Roberts, posterior probability statistics, and also Lusson. So um, during the seminar, uh, you will look at how this works for some particular scenario, for some particular good or not so good problems related also. How can we apply neural networks in this particular case? But for me, it's all for today. And I ask you, as usual, do you have any questions related to this lecture? If not, please write a plus sign in the chat and also let's mark our attendance today. Please turn on your cameras so I can make a screenshot here. Thank you. Have a nice day. And goodbye. And I think seminar will start in 10 minutes or a bit later if Evgenia okay, has some other things to finish. So let's have a short break now.